So our last uh, lesson told the story of uh, Isaac and Rebecca and how their marriage was arranged, you know, the messenger that went out. We said that uh, a significant factor about this chapter were the, uh, the types. Remember we talked about types. Types are like previews that preview ahead some of the things that may be an idea or a person or a teaching, something, you know that will come in the future and you get a kind of a preview for it. And uh, sometimes the preview is a person or the character of a person or the, the experience of an individual, uh, something like that. And so we, in our last lesson we said that Isaac and Rebecca were types for Christ uh, and His church. And one of the interesting things that we uh, talked about was that there was also another type, you know, uh, Abraham sends out one of his servants to go look for a bride for his, uh, for his son, and we said that the, the servant, you know, the messenger, was a type for the Holy Spirit who goes and seeks, if you wish, um, uh, those who will be part of the church, the bride of, uh, the bride of Christ. Um, uh, and in the end, we saw that uh, Isaac and Rebecca are married, and then the, uh, the chapter closes. You know, it's, it's almost like a happy ending. You know, he finds his beloved, you know, she sees him from afar. Who is that man? And it says uh, eventually they were married, and uh, he was comforted, it says. Isaac was comforted uh, with, by Rebecca uh, after the loss of his, uh, his mother. So the next chapters are going to lead us through the final days of Abraham and the beginning of the fulfillment of God's promise as Isaac and Rebekah begin having children. Remember you know, the original promise is he's going to have a seed, there's going to be a lot of children, there's going to be a, you know, generations that come after him. So far you know, one son, you know, one daughter, no kids yet, but we're going to see that uh, coming along. Now in uh, verses one to four, uh, of um, Genesis 25. Let's read that. It says, Now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore to him Zimran and uh, Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan and the sons of Dedan were Asherim and Lethushim and Leumim. Leumimim, yeah, that's it. Uh, the sons of Midian were Ephah and Epher and Hanak and Abida and Elda. All these were sons of Keturah. Not quite positive about the exact pronunciation of those ancient names, but I think we're close. So Abraham was 140 when Isaac married Rebekah and moved southward to Lahoi Roy, Lahai Roy. He is now left alone and so he remarries. And his new wife's name, as we say, is Keturah, means covered with incense, covered with incense. The Bible records that they had six sons in the following 35 years. The descendants of these eventually merged with other tribes to form the Arab nation. And it's funny, it just, just it writes it off, just 35 years, you know, I've, I've been married 35 years and it seems like a long time, you know, 35 years, but in the Bible it gets a line. You know, they were married 35 years, they had six sons. Think about it. Pregnancy, you know, all the things you go through in a pregnancy. They had six sons and they, it just, just, uh, just mentions it in passing. Why? Because it's connected to Abraham. But it's not germane, if you wish, to the main story of the, the seed, the promised seed. The promised seed is not coming through Keturah's children. They're still coming through uh, Isaac. So we go to verse uh, five, it says, Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, you see, but to the sons of his concubines Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life and he was gathered to his people. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre, uh, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, 
his wife. So note that although they are his children and he provides for each of them, the bulk of the wealth, the bulk of the estate goes to Isaac, not to Ishmael, but to Isaac. And Abraham dies at the, year, uh, at the age of 175. Notice now that the years of life are getting less and less, right? After the flood, the man's lifespan still is pretty big for us, but at that time, you know, before the flood, it was five, six, seven hundred years. Now it's down to 150, 170 years, and it gets even less and less as we read. He's buried by his two sons, who have since reconciled, apparently. They're not at war with one another at this point. The term gathered to his people suggests that he went to be with other believers that came before him. Because it can't be that he went to be at rest you know, with his people, the Jews, because he was the first of the, the Jews didn't exist. He was the first one of that race. It can't mean his family back in Ur because he has left them and disassociated himself with them. And so the, the idea of gathered with his people, his people are all the believers. The believers are his people. And there were believers before him, were, were there not? Of course there were, those who, believed in, those who believed in God. So he's buried with Sarah in the burial spot that he purchased. So now we have a transition at this point. The next six verses list the generations of Ishmael and the death of Ishmael at the age of 137. Notice it's starting to shrink, okay? This is a point where Isaac's record, Isaac is the one keeping and recording the record of Abraham and Ishmael. Remember we talked about that way at the beginning, how Genesis was written, right? Someone would write a part of it and then someone else would continue writing, if you wish. So Isaac's record ends here and another writer begins to record the history of the family and God's dealing with it. Probably begin reading Jacob's record from this point on. So you see how it works? Isaac writes Abraham's record. Jacob writes Isaac's record and, and so on and so forth. And so we move down to chapter 25, down to verse 19. And we have the story of Esau and Jacob. <clears throat> Just read a couple of verses here. It says, now these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, if it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. So again, the mother of the promised seed needs prayer in order to conceive. Isn't that interesting? You know, all, the, all the women, that God said, you know, the seed's going to go through you, had trouble conceiving children. Sarah was 90. Now Rebecca is not able to have children. She has to pray for God to give her the children. You know, what lesson? There? I don't know. Maybe God wants us to pray even for things that are promised. God's promised us that we'll be in heaven, but I don't know about you, but I keep praying for that. Lord, please, you know. Fulfill that promise. Don't let me, don't let me fail. Don't, don't, let, don't leave me behind. Don't allow the evil one to trick me out of my inheritance, whatever. You know, I pray for heaven. So there is a, a fetal activity, a lot of activity within her than normal, I guess, and God reveals that it is because each child represents a nation that will struggle with the other. And that's true if we read further down the line. Now the custom was that the older son receive a larger portion. Also, the older son was the head of the home when the father died, and he was also the first one to receive his inheritance. So God chooses the younger son to receive the promise in this case. Right? We said the older son is the one that gets the inheritance, but in this case, God wants the younger son 
to be the one. And of course, that's nothing new. It's unusual, but it's nothing new. Um, the, um, uh, we've had examples of this before. Seth, for example, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David, all of these were younger sons that were chosen by God over older brothers. Chosen by God because God knew their character and abilities in advance and offered them the opportunity to serve. They could have refused to serve. Some people say, oh, well, you know, they didn't have a choice. Sure, they had a choice. Saul, he had a choice. God chose him to be a king. He had a choice. He chose poorly. Judas, he was chosen to be one of the apostles. He had a choice. He chose badly. So we need to remember that when God chooses us to do something, well, not, in, not just in the modern day, but in the Bible, when God chooses somebody in the Bible and we read about their life, what we see is that person accepting God's choice and accepting to do what God has asked them to do, whether it be Moses or Abraham or whoever else. It's the same thing today. God chooses us for something. We can say, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to try that. You know, how many times have you heard that in a sermon? You, know, you don't want to do it? Don't worry, God will find somebody else to do it. It'll get done, it just won't get done by you or me, right? And so we go to 24. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth, red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So, the, uh, so his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. So twins are born, they're named in accordance with their appearance. Esau means hairy because of his robust and strong appearance. Jacob means uh, heel catcher or supplanter, which refers to his, it's not necessarily an evil name, it means he would be tenacious, he would be tough, he would be the type that never gives up. So you don't have to be big and strong and six foot four you know, and 300 pounds to be strong. You know, how many women have you known who are small little women but were powerful, why? Because they were tenacious, they would never give up. And so, so that was the essence of, of his character. So Isaac, 60 years old, that's 20 years after they were married when they finally have a child. So sometimes you have to pray a long time you know, to get the things that, that you want from God. So we go to verse 27 and 28, the birthright. We'll read that. It says, when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. This is a very brief but telling description of the development of these two brothers. Again, the Bible so economical in its discussions. Let's take a look at Esau, what it says. He was a cunning hunter. He knew, you know, he knew how to hunt animals. Now the thing about this is there's no virtue in that at that time because uh, there was plenty of food, plenty of meat. There was no game overpopulation. There were no wild beasts that were threatening him. So the thing you have to understand about Esau is he was a sportsman. Okay, so it wasn't like he needed to do this. He did this, it was his hobby, it was a sport. Okay? Um, and also he was a fornicator. Now one doesn't go with the other obviously, but we find that out about him as well later on. He was not interested in spiritual things. Uh, he wasn't interested in the family business. He wasn't interested in leadership. He wasn't interested in those things in the family. Uh, Isaac favored him in the same way that a father may favor a son who you know, is a general you know, goof off, but great at sports. Doesn't do much in school, doesn't, doesn't you know, pay attention at home, doesn't help out, nothing, but the kid has got a wicked curveball or something you know, in the fall. You, know, how you see fathers kind of living through their sons or even through their daughter's successes and achievements. So this is the kind of picture that it gives of Esau and the relationship that Isaac had with Esau. Then the Bible describes Jacob, <clears throat> excuse me. Plain here doesn't mean dull or uninteresting, it means serious minded. He was a serious minded guy, he was responsible, he was mature. 
He lived at home, he took care of the family business because you know, they had a business, they had a business to take care of. Uh, he was a believer in God, he believed in the promise, he wanted the promise, he wanted it, and so he believed in it. His mother, who was a spiritual woman, recognized this in him and she knew that God had said that Jacob would inherit the promise, so she favored him and she encouraged him. And I have a suspicion that both Rebecca and Isaac knew what God had said about these children. So it's Isaac who was like, you know, off the, uh, off the grid here. He was the one that was not in line with God's will. He, he enjoyed Esau and wanted to give Esau the, the favor, even though God had said the favor would go to, uh, to Jacob. So we keep going, when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field, he was famished, and Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I'm famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die, so of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Uh, let's keep, no, we've got that. So Esau returns from hunting. Uh, he's hungry, he smells the stew uh, cooking. He could have taken a moment to cook and prepare something for himself, but when Jacob offered him the food in exchange for his birthright, he agreed. Think about that. I mean, the birthright was the blessing of the older son, which included the double portion of the wealth, leadership in the family, responsibility as the spiritual head of that family. Esau couldn't care less about that. Esau was not interested in leadership, responsibility, spiritual things. He was interested in the double portion, however, because you, you, you see later on he kind of regrets it which he figured was so far off in the future as to not be of any use, so he agreed to make the trade, the blessing for the, for the stew. Now, I know that sometimes we read this passage and we see a certain unfairness there. Well, that Jacob, that sneaky little twerp, you know what I'm saying? And so thankfully, the Holy Spirit has given us one extra line there that tells us what God thinks of this. The Bible doesn't condemn G uh, Jacob, notice that? The Bible could have said, and thus Jacob was a little weasel, <laughs> you know? But it didn't say that, it condemns Esau. You know, he despised his birthright. Think of it this way, Jacob wanted it so badly, he was willing to deal for it. And Esau didn't care, he just gave it away. You know, God does not condemn Jacob because his fault was a lack of faith in allowing God to work out the promise. I'm not saying that what he did was not you know, sneaky in a way, opportunistic, I guess. He knew his brother didn't care and you know, it was kind of opportunistic. Instead of waiting for God to work out his purpose and ultimately give him what he promised him, once again, human nature, Jacob ran ahead and did it his way. Esau is condemned because he had no faith. And the lesson I draw from that is, better you have a weak faith or an impatient faith than no faith. I'll take that anytime. A weak faith or an impatient faith, a trembling faith, I'll take that over no faith anytime. And I believe that God will uh, as well. All right, so we go on. <clears throat> Isaac and the Philistines. Uh, verses one to five says that now there was a famine in the land besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt, stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and will give your descendants all these lands and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, 
my statues and my laws. So Isaac, he lives in the south and as the famine covers the land, he moves closer to the coast because the Philistines are along the coast. You know where the Gaza Strip is there? That's where the Philistines lived, along the, along the coast. And so uh, he has an intention of going that way and down to Egypt. So God's appearance to him suggests several things. First of all, there's the warning that he not leave the land of Canaan. I mean, he didn't leave to go find a wife. You know, don't leave now to go find food. If I can provide you a wife, I can provide you food. Secondly, a word of encouragement in the repeating of the original promise made to Abraham. You know, God knows how to encourage us. I don't know about you, but you know, in my life, in my ministry, every once in a while, you know, God does something, somebody says something, whatever, and you say, wow, this makes it all worth it. You know, Hal and I, we, we, we produce so much content for, this, uh, for our website, uh, you know, for our Bible Talk website. It's a lot of work you know, that goes into that, and now the books and all that stuff, and it's okay. It's, let's get it out there. Let's preach the gospel. Let's just do it. You know? But every once in a while, more often these days, we get mail back, you know, and I, I haven't even shown you what I've gotten lately, but I, we get mail back from people, from all, a guy from New York City just yesterday, you know, whoa, discover, where have you been, you people? You know, and he had all kinds of questions, and thank you so much, I'm listening to, a, I'm trying to listen to a video a day, he said, a video a day. Well, it's going to take him almost two years to get through, and even at the end of two years, he still won't get through all the videos. All I'm saying is that God has a way of sending just a little ray of light, sunshine into our lives sometimes that, that tells us, yeah, okay, I'm on the right track, I'm doing the right thing, and, and so that's what he does here with Isaac. You know, he, simply by repeating the promise, don't worry, the promise is still there, the promise I gave to your father, I'm giving to you, you're going to have it. You know, the circumstances have changed, but God's promise has not changed. Maybe Isaac's attitude towards Esau was a, an indication that his faith was growing weak and this episode had a way of kind of encouraging him a little bit. And then there's also a rebuke, a word of rebuke. God refers to Abraham's faith and obedience, not Isaac's faith and obedience, as a basis for what he is doing. Even when God rebukes us, He does it in a gentle way, but His gentle rebuke you know, is enough to melt us when we recognize it. You know, when Abraham was alive, God referred to his own obedience and faith, not that of his predecessors. So He says to Isaac, you know, I want you to have faith like your dad. He could have said, your faith is good, keep going, that's the way to do it. You know, but, but, no, He said, I want you to have faith like your dad. I mean, that's, it's, it's not a big thing, isn't it? But, but if you were Isaac <laughs> and God said to you, I want you to have that kind of faith, you would surmise sooner or later, oh, he's not, he's not exalting my faith. He's not complimenting my faith. And so there was a rebuke there. And then after this, I'm, we're not going to read it, verses 6 to 11, there's an interesting episode where Isaac lies to protect himself. He uses the same deception as Abraham by telling the Philistine king that uh, Rebekah is his, his uh, sister. And then the king finds out and he rebukes him for you know, endangering his people in this way and offers him protection. Same thing, you know, the, what is it? The, the apple doesn't far too fall from the tree. You know, same thing here. He repeats the same mistake. And so we go on, verse 12, it says, Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. See? They were dying of starvation, there was a famine, but he plants in the middle of all this and there's a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. For he had possession of flocks and herds and a great household so that the Philistines envied him. They envied him. One more. It says, now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines, stopped up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, go away from us, for you are too, par uh, too powerful for us. So what is really interesting is that even after this lapse, God blesses Isaac, not for his weakness, but because he said that he would take care of him, and despite Isaac's fear and Isaac's failure, God 
cares for him anyways. I've also believed that God can bless us in any type of an economy. The economy is bad, God can bless us during a bad economy and He can bless us in a good economy. You know, because, because our hope is not tied into the stock market. Our hope is tied into, into, into God. And God blesses him, not in a kind of penny pinching kind of a way, a hundredfold, a hundredfold. When did any investment that we ever made come a hundredfold? Man, I remember some guaranteed, they call them guaranteed certificate, guaranteed investment certificates. You know, the guys, oh, you can't lose, you can't lose. And it's true, a guaranteed meant your initial investment you wouldn't lose, you know what I'm saying? I think I made point, I made one half of one percent after five years. <laughs> And then I had a penalty because I moved to the United States and they charged me 10% penalty. <laughs> uh, I'm laughing now, trust me, but I wasn't laughing then. But, but I believe that God can bless you, you know, in any type of environment. So maybe the point for Isaac was that when the Lord protects you, you don't have to lie and cheat to get the king's protection. That's the point. Sorry, I drifted away there. In verse 17 to 22, again, I'm reading some and skipping over others because we don't have time. Isaac is asked to leave the Philistine country because he's so powerful. Imagine, he went there, lied to get this king's protection. God said, you should have depended on me. And then God blesses him to the point where he becomes rich and more powerful than the king he was going to get protection from. And that was like an object lesson. Isn't that wonderful when God blesses you to teach you something? Those are the kind of blessings, those are the days I like. You know? So in this passage, you, know, you see him slowly edging away from the Philistine land. He would, you know, this business about the wells, he'd move somewhere and dig a well and they'd fill it up. You know, they were just trying to get him to go away from them. And then finally, he dug a well and nobody bothered him and he named the well, the well of ample room which means that he found a place where he could live with all of his wealth and you know, animals and so on and so forth. So let's read 23, that we jump ahead. It says, then he went up from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there and there Isaac's servants dug a well. <clears throat> the thing that, the reason I read this verse here is that this is the only time that Isaac is seen building an altar and calling upon God. Abraham does it several times, Isaac does it, well we don't know, but we only, you know, it only writes this one time. So you need to think about that. You know, we, we, we say, you know, things were so bad, I just went into my room and fell on my knees in tears, you know, and I begged God, please help me you know, save my child, whatever. You know, we, that's our story sometimes. For them, that moment came when they built the altar, when they built an altar, you see. That moment of need, that moment of wanting to be close to God. And so Isaac's comfortable life is inter interrupted by famine. And then he has this moral failure before Abimelech. And then the necessity of having to move over and over again as the Philistines you know, drive, him, drive him back. That keeps him in prayer, that keeps him weak. All right? And so he builds the altar. The idea is that he builds this altar. It's the idea of submission, of calling upon God. You know? And I, I tend to think that a lot of times in, we, we, we get to that point last instead of first. You know, we, we try all the things and then finally we, we ask God. And I think this was going on with Isaac here. You know, finally he builds the altar. He says, God help me, my life has fallen apart here. And his prayer is answered as God appears and confirms his blessings and protections. Because a lot of times when things go bad, the thing we think of is that God doesn't like me anymore. Now intellectually, we know that that's crazy. You know, we've read the Bible, God sent His Son to die for us. But the problem is when we're having trouble, we're not using this, we're using this, we're using the heart. 
It's in the heart that we feel fear. I don't feel fear up in my brain, I feel it here in my gut. You know what I'm saying? I'm afraid something's going to happen, or I'm, I'm worried, I'm stressed. You know what I'm saying? And so God answers His prayer and confirms, don't worry, I, you know, I'll take care of you. All right? So Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, comes to Isaac, another story, we're not going to read the passage here too long, um, and makes a peace treaty with Isaac. Isaac is rich, growing more powerful all the time. Recent frictions may create resentments that he wants settled. Uh, he's treated them well, wants them to, um, you know, the, uh, wants this peace that they have to be the basis for a treaty. They agree on one and make a covenant of peace together. And at the same spot where Abraham and the former Philistine king had done so a hundred years before. So his son does the same thing with the you know, the local chieftain at this time. And then we'll finish up here, I believe. It says, when Esau was 40 years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. And this verse here serves as a bridge to get back to the family story which we will continue next week, because you notice we've taken some detours here. We've taken, we talked about Esau and Jacob being born in the, the stew, you know, the exchange of the birthright, and then the story kind of wanders off and talks about Isaac and his kind of spiritual journey, if you wish, and the challenges that he has, and now the story kind of is going to go back to the story of Esau and, uh, Esau and Jacob, get back on track telling the story of the seed of promise. So a couple of lessons, a couple of object lessons that we uh, can gather from this passage. Lesson number one, be careful what you give away. Esau did not recognize the value of what he had and carelessly and foolishly traded it for a bowl of stew. Where's the parallel? Well, young people sometimes give away their opportunities for a moment of maybe sexual pleasure or mental pleasure through drugs. We're always warning them about that. Don't give yourself away. It's what I said to my daughters, don't give yourself away. You, know, you have something precious, wait. Don't give yourself away. Don't be talked into giving your preciousness away to someone. Adults have a, you know, a natural respect and influence quotient for example, and sometimes they trade that away because of what we say uh, is inconsistent with what we do. Young people trust us, look up to us, and then they watch us do something that is completely opposite to what we're continually yakking about. You know, we're giving away our moral, um, our moral standing, our moral influence. Uh, Christians sometimes give away their peace of mind with God because they're curious or they're nostalgic about worldliness, imagine. So salvation is free, but if you throw it away, you can't buy it back. You need to be careful. Another lesson, you never suffer in vain. When trouble and suffering comes, you know, we may not deserve it. We don't always deserve what we, what we suffer. And we may not understand it or even be well equipped to deal with it. However, our suffering is never in vain as Christians. God had a purpose for Isaac's trials and He has a purpose for all of our trials as well. So you know, the suffering or the trial may not, make, uh, 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 may not make sense in itself, but God makes sense out of it for us. And in His hands, suffering will take on a purpose and meaning as well as profit. A lot of times the only prayer we make to God is take away the suffering. Just take it away, I'm tired of it. And it's normal human reaction, take away the suffering. And maybe sometimes the prayer should be, God, please do something with this suffering. I know it'll end one day, I'll either die from it or I'll get better, right? I'll either die from it or I'll get better. So I know there's an end, I don't know when, I know there's an end. But while I'm suffering, please do something with it. Make it count for me, so that at least the time that I have suffered is not completely wasted because I've not offered that suffering to you and allowed you to make something out of it. And then maybe a promise is a promise, certainly. God made a promise to both Abraham and Isaac 
and he continued to honor that promise. God's promises are not based on our performance or ability. They're guaranteed by God's power and goodness. And thanks be to God for that. Amen and amen. You know, look at Abraham and Isaac. Both father and son failed in exactly the same way. They lied you know, to protect themselves and they used their wife. You know, it's like shoot her. You know, they put her. You know. And yet God continued to keep His promise to them anyways. So the key is never to stop trusting that God will provide and save you and that trust will become evident in your life as you grow in faith. Thankfully, Abraham and Isaac both grew in faith after that major failure with the respective kings. All right, we keep going, we keep getting through the book of Genesis uh, next, uh, next time we get together. Thank you for your attention.